Dear friends, welcome you all once again. And today we again try to understand a little bit further on our uh, path to understand a little bit on the so super strings here. Okay. So Now, <coughs> let me just recap a few important points, okay? Uh, what we do is, uh, our aim is to understand the so-called super right? There are two very well-known approaches. The one that I would take towards the end, that we mention about it in the first place. This is called as a green swath formalism. In this formalism, what we do is, we, we extend the word sheet to uh, a super space. So, word sheet coordinates sigma alpha, we add some further Grassmann coordinates. And <coughs> so, In this, we introduce the idea of a super space and the idea of a super field. These are the two main important points. Here, super space is being spent by the super words. They are then described as the function of theta a, which are We have our word sheet spelled by the coordinates sigma alpha, which are sigma alpha, tau and sigma, or tau and sigma, or in the instant form of dynamics, or And theta a are some Majorana stars. Okay? So theta is graph marion. It means it anti commutes. Okay? It has the anti commuting properties and it's a Majorana spinner. two components Here what happens our word sheet becomes the so called super word sheet and it is described by the coordinate sigma alpha and theta a. Okay? These theta a are Grassmannian so they have an anti-commutation Grassmann and so on. And they are two component Majorana spinners. Majorana spinners are real spinners. Their components are real. Okay. And our word sheet is two-dimensional. So it's a two-dimensional super word sheet. And here we construct the super fields. Here I denote them by 
upsilon mu or by mu okay <coughs> and so by mu these are the super fields and they are functions of sigma alpha and theta I. and they can be uh, they can be this field can be can be expanded in the power theory of theta so here the first one is theta raised to the power zero so this is x mu and these x mu are our 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 fields x mu are our fields that we are familiar with uh, the polyacute action of the strange uh, sigma model it is minus c by 2 d to sigma square root of uh, h alpha beta d alpha beta here this d alpha beta is del alpha x mu del beta x mu so this x mu are our string modulus these are string modulus okay. so what are they we, we must try to understand it very carefully you see whenever it has a quantity has a index mu it means it's a mu vector but where is this a mu vector this is a mu vector in the in the space time manifold it's a mu vector in the space time manifold but my word sheet in this case is super word sheet it does not see this index mu for my word sheet it's a two dimensional scale of field. My bird sheet does not see this index mu. For bird sheet, it's a scalar quantity. So this x mu is a scalar quantity for my bird sheet. Okay? I will I will go a little bit into the details. Uh, as Eugenia in particular had not attended our last summer course. So wherever possible, I would recap the important things in the proper context. Okay. And this d alpha beta is this is the this is the uh, induced metric on the bird sheet. And <coughs> this h is the determinant of the alpha beta. Okay. So <coughs> it may be I, I, I might, uh, I might, but, but before I remove these things from here, let me say this, I am missing a mu here and this mu is here. If this has a index mu on this side, each term must ought to have an index mu, okay? Free index mu. So this, uh, the, the vector in the space time manifold, uh, has its components x mu and psi mu. Psi mu is fermionic. Psi mu is fermionic and it has so this is a Mayorana spinner with the two component spinner. And also we will realize that this is a by spinner. Okay. Many spinners have real components. Bio components, by spinners, they have definite ferrite. Okay. So <coughs> the the psi mu that we have in our theory are both many as well as spinners. Okay. And so their components are real. However, psi mu would have mu number of components. So, psi 0, psi 1, psi 2, psi up to 9. Because our superstring theory would be 10 dimensional. Okay? 
uh, it will automatically come when we talk about mass spectrum, the number of dimensions uh, would be fixed to D equal to 10. Capital D equal to 10. Okay. And anything else? So, and this is yet another field. You see, theta are constant. Theta are constant plasma numbers. Okay. So, theta are not functions of sigma alpha. Theta are not functions of sigma alpha. Okay. Otherwise, they would be fields. Anything which is a function of sigma alpha is a field. So uh, that may be enough. I will go into these details of this and into these details. So, but here it, it may be important to mention that this field B is called as the auxiliary field. And I can now write down the equations of motion for this capital by mu as well as for its component field. So it has three component fields, H mu, psi mu and B mu. I can write down the equations of motion for the component fields as well. And this theory, this theory is often called as the Oxfell theory because here this has this auxiliary field P mu. Then you obtain the euler lagrange equation for this particular field, component field B mu. This will come out to be B mu equal to zero. And if I implement that equation of motion into my theory, right, in the action, so then this theory would reduce to the now uh, other theory which I would call as RLS superstring formalism or the Raymond Nebuchadnezzar's formalism. Okay. This I would like to leave almost towards the end and now we will take up the first one, the other one in details. Is that okay? So when we implement the euler lagrange equation for Bay mu in this theory, then this theory would reduce into the RLS formalism. And that is called as the Onsell theory. Okay? Where we implement the equation of motion of the component field B mu. Okay? So, so much for this. And then we. Theta bar. So theta bar 
is permanent, psi is permanent, so theta bar into psi is again bosonic. So each term there in that expression bar bosonic. Alright? Now here, this first part, uh, let me write it minus t by 2 and d to sigma then alpha x mu plus psi y rule for then alpha i u. So, so this is my harmonic part. And this is my bosonic part. Okay? So, <coughs> we would try to understand both of them. And we would define each and everything there. And before I uh, proceed further, I would let me write because I would explain in details this and this both. So let me first write down delta x mu equal to epsilon bar psi mu and What we do? We have written some transformations, okay? And we want to know little bit about them. Not too much, but at least little bit about them. Here, we have introduced one new parameter, epsilon, which is again a two component Majorana spinner. This is a Two component Merovana spinner and it's a constant spinner. So what does it mean? Two component spinner, it has two components. Merovana spinner, it's a real. The components epsilon minus and epsilon plus are real. And constant spinner means epsilon is not a function of sigma alpha. Okay? So what happens? These are actually the gauge transformations of the theory. These are the gauge transformations of the theory and they are They are supersymmetric transformations. What happens here? Epsilon is constant. Epsilon is our gauge parameter. This is fermionic in nature. Now, these transformations, as you will read, take the bosonic fields into the fermionic field. and the fermionic fields into the bosonic fields. Okay? Of course, this, this rule would always apply, like if my left hand side is fermionic, my overall right hand side would have to be fermionic. So, so this, is, this is bosonic, this is bosonic, this is bosonic, this is fermionic. So overall it's fermionic, this is fermionic. Alright? Here, this is fermionic, this is fermionic, so its product is bosonic. However, my delta x mu, so this transformation uh, parameter delta, which is uh, 
of course infinite decimal but it's different than so because there are not there are not too many symbols available with us so we have to use one okay so uh, like we use the same delta for space translations and so on all right at different places but we but we mention what it is here this is the this is giving us a supersymmetric transformations these are the supersymmetric transformations and they take my bosonic phase into the fermionic phase and fermionic phase into the bosonic phase if we consider them at the classical level they are classical fields if we consider them promote them to the quantized a quantum mechanical operators then they are operators so bosonic operators into fermionic operators and fermionic operators into bosonic operators in fact this is the this is the year 1971 very important year in the history of string theory mr jervey this is jervey one of my great friends he was in india and i took him around a couple of places in north india and he was at ecole normale superiore i visited him in the early 90s in his office so mr jerry and sahita so in 1971 this particular transformation was discovered by mr jerry and mr sahita Jervin and Sapita they discovered this transformation, which relates bosons to fermions and fermions to bosons. Essentially, one could say that that gave rise to the birth of the so-called super string theory, because <coughs> the bosonic string theory alone would have bosons in the theory, but we consist of matter. Everything around us consists of matter. Matter is fermionic, right? so all of our table chalk myself everything all of us we consist of fermion so matter is fermion right so <coughs> this was very very essential very very crucial and of course these two names mr goldman and mr lichten If I make mistakes, you can correct uh, the spellings. These two names, Goldman and Lichten, they are the Russian physicists. They discovered four-dimensional <coughs> super quantum. They discovered the four dimensional super point area, and they were around the same time. Around the same time, and these guys they discovered that oh, there could be a, there could be a transformation that could relate bosons to fermions and fermions to bosons. So that way it was a, it was a, it was a great milestone in this in these studies. After that, lots of progress has been seen. So, uh, but this is. very story and here we we can i can say a few more things about this uh, like if this epsilon uh, epsilon is not a function of sigma alpha this is one thing that i explained so epsilon is a constant okay it means and epsilon is my gate parameter You know the gauge parameter it generates the, the gauge symmetries of the theory, and these are the gauge symmetries of the theory here. Okay, and also in the passing I might mention that in our theory here we have only one epsilon. We are lucky. What it means uh, if you do super symmetry in details, you talk about n equal to one, n equal to two, n equal to four, n equal to this super symmetry. What it really means practically for us. you would not have that much time to go into first i was thinking of developing uh, several lectures on super symmetry but we, we don't have that much time life is finite we have to finish a particular uh, thing 
in a particular given amount of time. <coughs> so, if your theory has only one epsilon, we say we understand by it that we are working with capital N equal to one super symmetry. And you will see that we are so lucky in the entire super string theory, you don't need more than n equal to two supersymmetries. For different reasons, the, the great guys have worked out many things, and I'm just stating the conclusion that so you have n equal to one super strings, n equal to two super strings. Okay, by n equal to two super strings, you would just simply you can look for my rest simple prescription that you can look for two epsilons. If you, if you have only one epsilon or two epsilon, okay, only one and n equal to one super symmetry. Okay. So all right, we are lucky right now we work with n equal to one super symmetry and this is not a function of sigma alpha, this is just a constant spinner. It means that in terms of the conventional uh, terminology of I would want it global global super symmetry. If, if my epsilon were a function of sigma alpha, then I would have local supersymmetry. Okay? So local plus is global. So we work with global supersymmetry. Uh, <coughs> it's not important, it's not necessary that a theory which is invariant under global uh, gauge symmetry would also be symmetric under local supersymmetry. May, maybe not. Okay? Maybe not. So it depends on um, what kind of uh, theory is. Okay. Uh, in our conventional field theory, I can always recap the simplest examples if you consider the complex scalar field theory that we have discussed a little bit, given by two fields phi and phi star. Uh, it is invariant under so-called global phase transformations or global gauge transformations. They are also sometimes called as the uh, gauge transformations of the first kind. And when they are uh, there, the gauge parameter is not a function of the of the uh, of F mu in field theory of F mu. Here it is not a function of sigma. Alright? And if you consider a theory like when you consider Higgs mechanism, so you consider complex scalar field theory along with the U1 gauge field, electromagnetic field, A mu, okay? And then, that theory, as you can see, is invariant under local gauge symmetry. So the gauge parameter there is a function of x mu, okay? So just to, my, my aim always is to connect the, the advanced ideas and topics with the already well-known simple idea in conventional field. Okay? Now we can proceed further. So that's fine. And this, therefore, you see, without this supersymmetric transformation, these are two, two fields. So this, without this term, this is a free field theory. Without this, this is a free field theory of fermions. This is a free field theory of bosons. Okay. This is anyway equivalent to one half d mu phi d mu phi. Right. And this is the, from the same analogous to the Dirac Lagrangian, okay? But the supersymmetry transformations, they relate that to. So they take modules to fermions and fermions to. Is this fine? Good. Now we are ready to, to understand these things further. Uh, let me initially address uh, this one, this little bit more. So let me, let me define uh, uh, let, me, let me first introduce the, because I would prefer to work with the uh, uh, well in any case let me first define rho rho 0 and rho 1. So rho 0 minus 1, 1, 0, 
and rho 1, I would define as 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay. Uh, in fact, in the literature, you will find a multiplicity of the uh, representation of these gamma matrices. These are gamma matrices here because we are dealing with two dimensional word sheet or super word sheet. So we are denoting them by different names, row 0, row 1, and there would be an equivalent of, of uh, your um, gamma 5, which is your. So, row 3, which is analogous to row 0, row 1, you can prove the entire, uh, entire uh, uh, algebra of uh, Dirac algebra of these gamma matrices. Okay? Uh, but uh, I should at least uh, give the definitions of row 0 and row 1. We would work with this particular representation. Okay, this is called as a Majorana representation. This is called as Majorana representation. Uh, in the literature, you can also find. Uh, let me let me just tell you uh, for for sort. So uh, here, uh, one thing more that I would define is uh, psi mu bar would be defined as the, the Dirac, uh, Dirac conjugate and this is the Dirac adjoint uh, psi mu dagger times i rho 0. Sometimes i into rho 0 is defined as beta. Yet another matrix beta which is i into i of i rho 0. So, this is psi mu bar transpose into some matrix C is psi mu dagger i to 0 and this is my charge conjugation matrix C is charge conjugation matrix, which is defined as iota into rho 0. And if you have that, then you can see from here, psi mu transpose uh, is just simply equal to psi mu dagger. And actually, it just amounts to psi mu transpose is equal to psi mu transpose and complex conjugate. So this tells you psi mu bar is psi mu star and this tells you that psi mu plus minus is psi mu star plus minus, so psi mu is real and its components are uh, Some of us, they take 
the definitions of rho zero in the definitions of rho zero and rho one, they take iota here, iota here, which means overall multiplied by iota, and this also multiplied by iota here, iota here, so overall multiplied by iota. This is just I have mentioned it. It's enough to work with one combination. But if you are reading, if you happen to read the other, just just watch out for the definition of rho zero and rho one. Is an iota sitting inside or not? If yes, you, you can pull it out and accordingly take care of it. Okay? Alright? So, uh, this is what we work with the so called Majorana representation, and here we don't have this iota inside. Okay? So, we take care of it. But overall physics remains the same because if they have this iota iota here, then as you will see, there is one row sitting here, so they, you, they will have one iota sitting there. You see, the, the other authors that use iota here and here, they would have one iota sitting here. Because their row also contains one iota inside, okay? So iota into iota, and then they will have a minus here. Okay, so you pull out the iota from here and multiply it with minus iota that gives you plus one. Okay? So this uh, I thought I should mention it to you so that whichever article you are reading, whichever book or article you are reading, you can, for example, miss your kaku. You use iota here, here, and here, and here. And this Baker, Baker, and Swap, they, they work according to my, the conventions that I am using. Okay? So, I mean, this, I am talking about the famous, uh, more modern books on, because they are, large number of books on string theory, super string theory, and if you start working <coughs> with the real older ones, you may be in more difficulty. So it is just the same story with field theory. If you read now uh, many modern texts, uh, books are available on quantum field theory, and if you happen to read them, you learn it much faster. And if you go back to the uh, older books, which are the real classic books on field theory, uh, which have produced so many of field theories. Uh, but, but if you try to work with them initially, you may be in more difficulty. You will find, oh, it's a very tough, difficult subject, because they go into many, many things. And now, uh, you are living in the fortunate times. There are many, many modern persons available. Okay? So I have just told you the difference, for example, with Michio Kaku and with Baker, Baker and so on. So, okay? So this, I uh, have I'm uh, following in Baker, Baker and so on. Alright? Then yeah, very famous one. <coughs> so, now, let me go a little bit beyond this. But, uh, uh, I am still leaving it because we need to understand both these parts very well, but the, the, from the, the point from where we have started, uh, we, I would not forget that and I will come back to it at an appropriate time. <coughs> uh, maybe I can, uh, I, can, I can cover it up today itself. The very first thing that uh, Sada has asked me is uh, about this uh, construction of the higher energy states. So you see, here, uh, the this part of the first part, bosonic part, would give me this kind of equation, and the other one would give me right. So this bosonic part would give me something like this massless plan Gordon equation for this field x mu. Okay? And this second part, harmonic part, would eventually give me uh, Dirac equations for these two component uh, spheres. Uh, <coughs> or this is written in the component form for the multi components. Okay? So uh, here you will get Dirac equation, here you get plan Gordon equation. And then, uh, I, I will derive them properly. Here, let me mention to you one thing, that how do you do, how do you, how do you obtain the equations of moves? 
but we do it, we consider the action. That is always a starting point. Okay, we are doing conventional field theory, conventional string field theory. So our our action of the theory is the first defining uh, object which defines our theory. Okay, so the action of the Lagrangian of the Lagrangian analysis that is fine. They are all equivalent. Okay, if you know one, you know the other. Now, what you do is you use the various methods to derive the equivalence of motion. The standard procedure is variational principle and you obtain the equations of motion. So what happens in both of these cases? We will deal with them separately and then we can understand them collectively. For example, in the first part, I would not only have this term, but I would have some extra terms, which are called as the boundary terms. So, for example, in this case, I would have x prime into delta x, of course mu, if you can put mu here or mu here, and, and you will have terms also, I am I'm not bothered about this signature of the term, and I would also have term s mu dot delta s mu. So that is my x prime mu. This is the sigma of x mu, and x dot mu is delta of x mu. Okay? X tau. Uh, so, <coughs> You will have, using the variational principle, not only this term, but some terms which I would call as the boundary terms. Okay? Which you would call as the boundary terms. Now, our action is, has to be Lorentz invariant. Has to be a Lorentz scalar. Each observer must be able to compute the same action for the theory. So it has to be Lorentz scalar. And what do you do for this? <coughs> the boundary terms have to vanish. The boundary terms have to vanish. How do we do that? So we impose some boundary conditions. On the so these boundary conditions, you can have a multiple choice for these boundary conditions, but the objective is that these terms, which are the boundary terms, the extra terms other than, so you have you have uh, this piece which when equated to zero in the variation of here for example delta of psi mu plus, here multiplied by delta of psi mu minus, this would be the coefficient and so on. We will, we will obtain them. But the main idea is, so we have to make the boundary terms vanish, so we have to choose them boundary conditions in such a fashion that the boundary terms disappear. Okay, that's the only one line principle. And the same principle applies also to this. When you use the variational principle with this second part, fermionic part of the theory, you again derive. So there will be some terms, so one term corresponding to this, one term corresponding to this, plus there would be more terms. They would be the boundary terms. They would be the boundary terms and our aim is to make them vanish. Alright? So we choose, we impose boundary conditions in such a fashion so that the boundary terms disappear. So, for example, in, for this particular case, uh, it may not always be possible to, to make every boundary term vanish individually. So you can choose Though, so this is not even important for us, whether the, each term vanishes individually or all of them vanish collectively. Our aim is to make them vanish. So therefore, for making the Fourier modes, for, for considering the Fourier modes, we have to take into account those boundary conditions, which make our boundary terms vanish. 
okay, whether individually or collectively. So you can always have multiple choice for the Fourier mode theory. But here, psi f mu being both on it, I would have the whatever Fourier mode I eventually write, they would be bosonic in character, they would be bosonic in nature. So they would go with the commutation relations and so on. The kind of we have developed a little bit on this, the bosonic ones. And then you when you make the Fourier expansion for this field psi mu, it would involve some annihilation phase and operator, the so-called Fourier modes. Uh, in string theory. These Fourier modes that would appear in the in the Fourier expansion of psi mu plus and psi mu minus, they would be fermionic. They would be fermionic and for this I would introduce the fermionic oscillator and they would then simply obey that kind of algebra of the uh, algebra of the uh, annihilation phase and operators for the Fermi oscillator. Okay, for Fermi oscillator. So that is one thing we need to do. While it is still being written here, I might recap a little bit that you see for these two kind of choices, one invents here, I can have it if I have delta x mu equal to constant with time okay then it's uh, this derivative would vanish and this term would vanish and this happens for uh, Still, I want the term 
time something. I want this thing to vanish. So I import a prime mu is equal to zero. This is the uh, this is the which means the space derivative of x So the space derivative of x Is this fine? Yes. I was yes. thinking immense, but the endpoints are moving on the same. So sigma is constant. In which uh, one? Uh, In which one? I cannot. No, you, 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 you only try to think like this. If the end of the string, if I am holding the end of the string okay. or not, mm. here I am not holding, so the end can also move around. Okay. It can move around, it can go up or down, or it can move around in space. Here, the end is not allowed to move around. It has to remain fixed at the same point. So, S mu does not change. And if it does not change, it gives me its delta of f zero or time derivative, which is uh, uh, delta of f zero. Okay. So <coughs> and so so and for the other kind of strings, the closed strings, uh, in fact, a closed string has no boundary. A closed string itself is a boundary. For example, of a tube, uh, the girls use these rubber rubber loops for the hair. This you cut, you take a tube and you cut them into thin slices. Each slice is a, a, a closed string, right? So the closed loop. Uh, we have to imagine that its width is zero. Okay, so the 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 width of the string there, there is no width. Okay, so zero width. So a, a closed string itself is a boundary of some tube, and boundary of a boundary is zero. Or in any case, the the same end it comes back to itself. So you take periodic or anti-periodic boundary. Okay. So <coughs> and for the open strings, you have either uh, and and the b and b of b and the one okay so uh, little bit about this i thought it was the right moment to talk about this and then we would also talk about this let me again create a space whatever i need i should write again <coughs>